Hi, everyone. I am happy to introduce Margaret Scholes. She is currently the Executive Director of International Organic Inspectors Association, and she will be presenting today. Thank you, Margaret. Thanks. Um, a little bit about myself. I've been inspecting organic farms, livestock, and processing facilities for over 30 years and teaching inspectors almost that long. Uh, we're located in southeastern Montana. My husband and I are small ranchers and we raise a cow-calf operation. And um, about 1990, I started doing inspections in Nebraska. So it's nice to be working with people in Nebraska again. If you're just starting the transition to organic, the organic system plan can be sound daunting. The forms are long, there's lots of questions, but um, most people who start transition and develop an organic system plan find that it actually helps them in making management decisions. And it is the document that you submit to your certification agency once you've chosen that certifica certification agency. And it's your communication with them. They usually will only send one person a year to the to the farm and that's the inspector. And the inspector uses the system plan to make sure that everything is accurate and make any updates with you if there are updates. So the forms are uh, different for every certification agency. And it's probably one of the things to think about when you contact certifiers and ask about the, the form, um, if you're try trying to choose a certifier ask to see their forms and see how they work. Because some of them will work better for vegetable operations, maybe. Some of them might work better for grain operations. And some of them are just more compatible with electronic digital systems. And some may be more easily adapted to, to uh, hard paper if you want to do paper copies. So this is what we'll do in this session, is I will provide an overview of the USDA organic standards primarily crops. We're not going to talk about processing and a tiny bit about livestock. To explain what the organic system plan is, if I sometimes use the acronym OSP, you'll know what I'm talking about and why it's important for transition. You don't wanna wait until you're ready to get certified and then start your system plan. It's something that you should develop and use throughout the transition. And to apply the National Organic Program regulations for crops to your operation and hopefully to get you started on your own system plan. The NOP is the acronym for the National Organic Program and I'll probably find myself using that some too. Uh, what we'll do is look at six main areas. We don't have time to go through absolutely every part of the system plan. For example, we won't talk about greenhouse. We won't talk about wild crop harvest. There are other parts of the system plan form that would maybe apply to your operation that we won't have time to cover. So for each topic area, we'll talk about the standards for that topic and we'll reference the, the pages in the system plan. And I'll explain a little bit more which ones I'm using because I just told you that everyone is different for different certifiers. So um, first website, um, locations for the standards or the regulations, same thing, and where to find the sample form. So there's a link right here in this presentation, and that would take you to the forms that I'm using. There are um, some sample forms on the USDA website, and that's what we will be showing you and talking about at this uh, in this session. When the inspector does come, what we're doing is to verify that your OSP, your system plan, is complete and that it's accurate and that you're not using any inputs that are not listed that the certifier didn't know about, we're verifying that your, your plan is in place. So this is a, um, a shot of the USDA website. And um, if you go there, you can always find the regulations. And I've just put a little red circle here around where you can find the standards, the regulations, it shows up about three or four different places. So you can't get lost on the USDA website. You can always find the standards or the regulations. And so if we're clicking in a little deeper into the USDA website, you'll see 
here, this is another link for the USDA organic regulations, and they also have them in Spanish. And then there's another document here that, called the Program Handbook. This has all kinds of useful information in it that is not in the regulations, but it's explaining its guidance, its explanations of how the NOP um, views what the regulations say. It won't be anything additional, but it explains the regulations. And in this program handbook, you can find the, all of the documents that you'll be seeing throughout this presentation. There's also the Organic Foods Production Act there. It goes back to 1990. The regulations were not written and finalized for 10 years, so they were released in 20, in the year 2000, and then fully implemented in 2002. So they're now about 20 years old. And everyone that's certified in the United States has to follow those standards. We don't have multiple standards in the, in the US. This is, if you click even deeper into seeing what the regulations look like, it'll take you to this maybe daunting uh, document called the Code of Federal Regulations, Title Seven, Parts 205. That's the organic regulations. I encourage you to actually read them. There are not as many pages there as you think. And the main parts that you need to read as a crop producer um, don't end up being that many pages. So uh, they do change. Um, we have a National Organic Standards Board that advises the NOP, and they do change the standards, mostly the list, although we just experienced a really major change in this past year that will be fully implemented on March 19th. It's called Strengthening Organic Enforcement, and it was part of the last Farm Bill passed by Congress because of some major concerns about fraud in the organic uh, market. Um, so this is what they look like. We aren't going to spend time to, to really go through them in detail, but we will cover most of the main parts of the standards. So these are the six topic areas. We'll be talking about land management, field history, boundaries, and buffer zones, and seeds and planting stock, and soil fertility, crop rotation, manure, um, pest and weed management and record keeping. And then there's some other stuff at the end that kind of comes from other parts of the regulation. And starting with the subpart A is the definitions. And we often don't read the glossaries and the index and the definitions, but this is one thing that you do want to do. If you read the standards, read the definitions. And, and for example, crop rotation is defined in the regulation. Um, so it is a production system. This is organic crop production. There's actually a definition for that in the rule. It's a production system managed to respond to site-specific conditions by integrating cultural, biological, and mechanical practices that serve these three functions, fostering cycling of resources, promoting ecological balance, and conserving biodiversity. And the reason I bring this up is that there's no other place in the entire regulation that addresses biodiversity or ecology or says you have to foster cycling of resources. So sometimes there is really important information in the, in the definitions. Mostly we'll be talking about this part of the regulation, which is the, um, it defines what's in a system plan and it says what you have to do. It says that you have to, um, have a, it has to contain a description of the practices and procedures. What crops do you grow? What equipment do you use? Um, do, you, um, do you use any inputs? Um, it'll ask you a lot of, uh, there's a lot of questions in the system plan and they're usually check boxes and short answers, but any inputs that you use have to be part of your system plan. And we'll talk a little bit more about inputs and the record keeping we'll also talk about and the monitoring practices um, for your organic system. It also, a very important part of your system plan, has to describe management practices and physical barriers to prevent contamination and commingling. Now, contamination and commingling are not the same thing. Contamination is contact with the organic crop and a prohibited substance. So it might be um, a spray from a herbicide or a fungicide on a seed treatment. Um, uh, it might be a, a fumigant in a stored grain bin. Any of that is contamination. 
but commingling is the mixing of organic and non-organic crops. So if you forget to clean out the soybean bin and you dump in a uh, load of organic soybeans, there's really no way you can separate the, uh, the two. So that would be commingling and it would be not allowed in organic. So you have to have, there's a lot of ways that you can have commingling, a lot of ways that you can have contamination. So um, your uh, system plan really focuses a lot on that. And if you have uh, maybe shared equipment, if you have a custom harvester, if you share your equipment with someone else, if you have leased land that you may not have 100% control over, all of those kind of things can lead to problems. And the, the system plan asks a lot of questions about that. So here, that is what is required in a system plan. This is what is not allowed in organic. And this is um, from 205-105. It's actually not a very big section of the rule, but it's really important what is not allowed. Synthetics are not allowed unless they're on the, the list. And 205-601 is the list of allowed synthetics for crops. And 603 is the allowed synthetics. Whoops, I'm going to go back. 603 is the list of allowed synthetics in livestock. And they're both pretty long. You'd be surprised how many things are allowed. It might be plastic mulch. It might be chlorine. It might be copper sulfate. There's all kinds of things that are not natural. And if they are not on the list, they are not allowed. Um, so the synthetics have to be listed. And then the, the naturals are all allowed unless they're prohibited. So there are quite short lists of prohibited naturals and they're things like tobacco. Um, tobacco used to be a long time ago, a very popular pest control substance and for, for some people who felt they were organic. But when we wrote the organic regulations, it was prohibited. Um, so the excluded methods is a strange name a little bit for most of us for GMOs. There's nothing in the regulation that says you cannot use genetically modified organisms or genetically engineered organisms or seed or materials. But the term that's just defined in, in the definitions is, uh, is for excluded methods. And that's what it means. Excluded methods, there is an allowance for vaccines, but we're talking about crops today, not livestock. Then ionizing radiation is not allowed and sewage sludge is not allowed. There's actually several places in the rule that spell out that you cannot use sewage sludge, which won't be called sewage sludge on the label. It will probably be called biosolids and biosolids would be, um, would make a compost that would otherwise be okay. It would be prohibited. So this is kind of uh, page one of the system plan form that goes on for maybe 25 pages. And remember that I gave you the link where you can go back and access these documents. The, um, this is for crops and the questions are not particularly that hard. Oftentimes you hear that paperwork is horrendous and scary and organic certification, but actually um, if you start filling it out, most of the questions are things that you just already know and you don't have to look a lot of them up. Sometimes if you're fortunate enough to have an equip, um, equip grant or some of the other government programs, a lot of the documents will, re will really work well for the system plan too. So the, one of the things as an inspector that we really look at is this, is your crop production system all organic or organic and non-organic? It is allowed to have a split operation. You don't have to have an all organic operation, but if you do have a split operation, which means you have organic and non-organic crops, we really have to look a lot more closely to make sure there is not contamination or commingling occurring. There's usually, in addition to the system plan form, there are documents that you attach. And one of the always required documents, no matter who the certifier is, are the maps, the maps and field histories. So we need to know for three years back, at least, what crops were grown, what inputs were used, and a good set of farm maps is an essential part of the system plan. And typically, these are on the list of attachments 
field history uh, input list, often an attachment. And the maps need to be good enough that along with the system plan, they show all of the borders of the, of the fields. So if you're next to conventional um, operation, how do you prevent contamination? And typically that would be with a border, a buffer. And so if your map, the more that your map shows and the more that your field history and your map jive, the more time you save on inspection, just a very, but you will be asked to describe all of the boundaries and buffer zones for, for all of the fields. So talking a little bit more than we're, we're now to topic one and um, there is a hard and fast rule with all organic production. And that is that you can have no prohibited substances on the field for three years before you can harvest uh, an organic crop, that's 36 months. So we don't require, there's a lot of practice standards in the regulation. For example, when you put the manure on, whether the seed is organic, um, whether all kinds of things like that, that we call practice standards. You may not have followed those standards last year, but you could still be certified. But if prohibited substances are on any time in that three years, it simply takes out um, the, the whole, the field. And you can even um, plan your cropping system as you're transitioning to, to take this into account. For example, if you have a vegetable operation and you're looking at the 36 months, if you planted something like um, lettuce or something that was harvested early in the season, it might not be certified. But if you planted winter squash, it would be after that 36 month date before you could harvest it. And, uh, and it can be even leaving grain standing in the field. If you had rye, for example, that's harvested earlier and you uh, had a herbicide that was applied three years ago, you literally can just let it stand in the field longer before you harvest it. So what matters is the 36 months and the date of harvest. Now also distinct defined boundaries on buffer zones are required. And one of the most common misconceptions I think among producers both certified and not certified is that there's a specified number of feet that's required in a boundary or a buffer zone. And it's not. This is how good the buffer has to be. It has to be adequate to prevent the unintended introduction of a prohibited substance, which in some ways makes it a little harder. But sometimes you hear people, no, if you have 25 feet or no, it has to be 30 feet. And there's nothing in the regulation that spells exactly the um, distance. One thing that's really important though, is another common misconception is that you can transition organic um, or you can transition non um, GMO alfalfa to organic. And it would never be okay to, to transition it, even if it's been in the field for more than 36 months before you harvest it, because it's still a GMO crop. And, um, and GMO seeds are actually considered a prohibited substance. So that would include pasture if you're um, planning to transition your livestock is that it would not be organic pasture unless it's been um, free of prohibited substances for 36 months. So they have to eat organic pasture for a certain length of time, but you could certify your pasture after 36 months. So um, you can actually, another question that comes up is you can include in your system plan uh, Bureau of Land Management, BLM land, or state lease land, or forest proper, forest land, those can be included in your system plan, but you have to be able to show that they are not um, compromised with prohibited substances. So a little bit more about buffer zones. Um, we will always, the inspector virtually always will uh, want to see the buffer zones that are next to conventional crops. And things to think about, um, one inspection I did, I was real surprised, um, the neighbor had a pivot um, irrigation system that had a little bit that went over the organic farm. 
which wouldn't be a worry in itself, but what if they fertigated? And it turned out that they did. They actually added a fertilizer to the water so that little piece of the organic farm couldn't, couldn't be certified. And the management practices can include um, letters to the highway department, letters to the neighbor. Um, it can include signage, uh, and there are quite a few signs, and that's culturally different depending where you live. Sometimes people feel like they're rude and they don't have that kind of relationship with their neighbors and they want um, that they have more of a spoken and and written notification to the neighbors and, and they ha have no problems. Sometimes um, buffer zones can be an issue with pasture because you can always leave a border before your corn, but then if you turn the cows in and they're organic cows, they're going to eat the buffer too. Sometimes you can, um, we see tree rows, hedgerows, and sometimes they're just a buffer is left for a, a wildlife or for birds. And sometimes it's bailed up for uh, non-organic livestock feed, but we're very interested in buffers when we come. And it's something you really wanna think about in your system plan. So in the in the system plan form, you'll see it'll ask you to attach a map, and this is this is pretty um, this is pretty typical that they'll want you to attach uh, a map. And this is how good it has to be. It needs to show no, which way is north. It needs to show the buffers. It needs to show the acres. It needs to, and in some cases, if you're, you're dealing with irrigation. Um, slope is very important and and there's typically a separate section so if you're a dry land operation you wouldn't even have to fill out the irrigation section so some certifiers have whole separate they call them modules and so you if you have a greenhouse operation you fill that one out if you irrigate you fill that one out and you fill out all the applicable modules most of us end up filling out a long form and then not applicable for some sections but it will ask you, as I said, to describe all the boundaries and, and buffer zones and, and uh, what's happening on the adjacent land. So one of the things that differs the most between certifiers, the different, everybody has a section in their system plan about natural resources, but they vary a lot. And that program handbook that I mentioned that's on the NOP website has a great document in it. It's about six pages long, I think, about natural resources on an organic operation, because it took a while before we realized that the that not everyone was applying the rule as well as they could have been to the natural resources. And to make the rule says you have to maintain or improve soil and water quality. So it does require that you take care of natural resources. Oddly enough, natural re resources of the operation is is defined in the in the definitions. So what we're looking for here is to make sure that the, in, the natural environment is not degraded, that it's, um, and hopefully enhanced. Hopefully people are planting trees or, or trying intercropping or using strip, tro strip cropping or contour planting and all of those kinds of things. And maybe um, with all the assistance from NRCS, there's conservation strips with native plants. Um, how how you are dealing with wildlife, which can be both a natural resource or a pest, depending how you look at it and depending on the system, we will ask questions about that. But the system plan forms differ a lot. Some of them just are very short and they remind you you have to be concerned with it. Some of them have two pages or three pages of questions about it. So when these little pop-ups happen, it means they're referring to those generic or OSP forms that are on the NOP website. Second topic, seeds and planting stock. Um, pretty straightforward here. Seeds have to be organic if you're raising sprouts. So that is the only crop that absolutely has to be planted from organic seed. Otherwise, there's an allowance for untreated non-organic seeds if you're unable to find organic seed in the needed form, quantity, or quality. It's called commercial availability. If organic seed is not commercially available, you can plant non-organic seed. You can never plant treated seed unless it's 
planted with something that's on the list uh, for organic seed. And there, there isn't anything on the list for organic seed except for cotton seed. For delinting uh, the cotton seed, they have to take the, the lint off of it to be able to get it to go through the planter. Now, there are some natural substances that are allowed, and it's very common on organic farms to see the seed treated, but it's being treated with something that's natural. And if it's natural, it's allowed. So there is an allowance for non-organic planting stock for perennials, as long as you're not harvesting for a year. So something like apple trees, blueberry bushes, um, asparagus. There's lots of things that people generally plant often plant from non-organic planting stock because they know they won't be planting them. Um, they won't be harvesting anything for at least a year. So as I think I've already mentioned, prohibited for three years is GMO variety seed or seeds treated with prohibited substances. We will be, um, when we come, we're really happy if we see that USDA seal on the, on the sack of, of seed. But, we, it, but it is pretty common that we see non-organic seed. What you have to do is to try to get it from at least three known suppliers of organic seed. And if you can't get it from those three sources, then you keep records. That's a common thing people don't realize. They make the phone calls, but they don't write them down. Um, so they call three sources and then they purchase non-organic seed and, and plant it. When we're looking at planting, uh, we're always looking at planter boxes um, in grain drills. And, and we know that sometimes you have used equipment, which either you purchased it and it's red inside or it's red inside because you used to apply insecticides yourself. It doesn't mean that you can't use them. You just have to clean the planting equipment out and, um, and do your best to make sure that there's not a contamination problem. That would be a contamination problem. Um, a little word about GMO contamination. Um, if you're planting a crop like corn or soybeans, that's very, very prevalent in the uh, GMO varieties if you're a non-organic producer, is that organic seed can be contaminated with GMOs. It can happen. But for sure, it's more likely to happen in non-organic seeds. So when you buy non-organic seed, just be aware that you may be buying seed that is um, allowed because it's not treated, but it may be contaminated with a prohibited substance um, or with GMOs. And, and it's more likely to happen in non-organic seed. There's no specified like 5% GMO contamination is allowed and 6% isn't. There's nothing like that in the regulation. But some markets will not buy um, buy your grain if it is contaminated to a certain level. So it's something to think about. It's the most common way that seed gets contaminated with GMOs is um, I, that crops get contaminated with GMOs is is actually the seed. I one time and also inoculants are something to think about. I once inspected a producer um, who had done everything right. He. He was a very honest producer. I wasn't worried. I thought this will be an easy inspection. It turned into one that I have remembered forever. It wasn't easy. He had um, planned his rotation so that he would plant sweet clover with his uh, spring wheat seed. So he would plant sweet clover seed with his spring wheat seed. And then the following year, it would be a green manure crop, which is a great thing. It's efficient. You're not having to go over and um, plant another crop at a different time. It provides a legume in your rotation, a green manure in your rotation. We love, we love systems like this. Um, but he said, uh, I have a problem with the seed. And I said, well, we'll look at it when we do the records inside. I didn't realize he was giving me an alert for a really big problem. But when we finished all the field inspection and went into the house and we're sitting at the table, he pulled out his seed tags and he explained what had happened, that he had ordered not, um, he had ordered the sweet clover seed to be non-GMO. And he um, went and picked up the pallet of sweet clover. And the only mistake that he did was he hadn't read the tag and he planted like hundreds of acres of spring wheat with this inoculant. 
And then when he was getting ready for the inspection and he got out the tags, he looked at it. And instead of Dormel, it was Dormel Plus. And it said biotechnology enhanced. And he lost certification on hundreds of acres just from not reading the tag. He did everything else right, but that was the only mistake that he really made because the inoculants uh, cannot be GMO either in addition to the crop seed. So you'll find a section in the system plan and some certifiers don't re even require that you list the organic seed. They'll say, list any seed that's not organic and then explain where you got it, um, what the variety is and everything. But there'll always be a section in the system plan. And here's just an example from that form that's on the NOP website. Is um, what are the treatments, inoculants? Um, if you're buying any uh, planting stock for, for horticultural crops, you need to think about that one year. There's actually an exemption for strawberry plants, which we think of as perennials, right? But in many of the um, parts of the world, or at least in this country, they're treated as annuals. And they are um, in the program handbook. They get, there's a doc guidance document that says that strawberry plants are um, planting stock. And if you can't, um, it, they're vegetative. So they sit, they're allowed to be um, non-organic, which is a little surprising. The planting stock would be something like potatoes. If you can't get non-organic potato pieces, um, you can you can use uh, non-organic planting stock. So seeds and planting stock can be um, planted from non-organic. So topic three, soil fertility, crop rotation, manure management. This is probably... This is the biggest section in the regulation, is the part about soils appropriately because everything about organic is, is a healthy soil based. And there's uh, two sections, there's one on crop rotation and there's one on soil, soil fertility. So altogether, they really make up a big part of the crop production standards. It requires that you have tillage and cultivation practices that maintain or improve the physical, chemical, and biological condition of soil and minimize soil erosion. So that's the basic requirement. Oddly enough, there's no requirement for a soil test. So some of these things become a little tricky for the inspector to verify and for the producer to um, confirm if there aren't any soil tests, but they are not required. You also must manage crop nutrients and soil fertility through through rotations. There's a couple different ways that crop rotation is stated as required that, and cover crops. It doesn't specifically say legume cover crops, but it does say cover crops and plant and animal materials. You can't contaminate the soil or the crops or the water with those materials. And once again, you must use a crop rotation. You'll find also in the OSP form, there's a lot of questions about crop rotation. And this is um, this is really key to an organic system, a, a soil building crop rotation, because that's your primary source of fertility, unless perhaps you have access to lots of manure. That's another way that people um, maintain an organic system if it's if they're putting on a fair amount of manure. Crop rotation is required and it's also defined in the in the let me just go back crop rotation is in the definitions defined as not repeating the same crop or crop family from one year to the next without interruption so sometimes people plant maybe a cover crop in between and technically that's that makes it allowed to have the same crop two years in a row, but inspectors are always taking notes and reporting to the certifier if the same crop is planted for two years in a row. And manure and compost um, is, is pretty regulated in two ways. One is compost is as only if it's made as defined in the regulation, and that's the same as the NRCS definition. It's the number of times it's turned, the number of the carbon to nitrogen ratio, the um, 
the temperature that it achieves, all of those things. It's really kind of highly regulated. Most farmers don't call their compost compost. They just put it on as manure, even though it's, it is actually probably compost. It's simpler not to keep the records and prove to the inspector that you, um, that you composted it according to the definition. So if it's not compost, if it's compost, you can use it anytime. There's no restriction on compost. But if it's not compost, then it's manure and it's considered raw animal manure. Even if you did a great job of composting your biodynamic compost, it doesn't quite met, meet the definitions. It's considered raw manure. And if you're using it for crops for human consumption, that matters. If it's a crop, for example, for feed or, or fiber, um, you don't have to worry about the restriction. But if it is for a crop for a human consumption, it's very important that you not in, that you incorporate the manure at least 120 days before harvest if the edible part has direct soil contact, like carrots. If it's um, a crop where you don't have that soil crop contact, like maybe sweet corn, then it's 90 days. And so you can you can start to see the number of things that you need to have documented in your system plan, but also in your record keeping system that you keep at home. And this, this is um, typical to what a system plan would look like. Do you use uncomposted raw or aged manure? Well, it didn't be, meet the definition of compost, so the answer is yes. And then if yes, are you applying it to a crop for human consumption? And if so, are you doing, following all these rules? The, the fourth topic is pest, weed, and disease management. And we'll talk about inputs here, even though inputs could be um, talked about in soil fertility or in seeds or any place else. This is where we'll talk about them. Inputs are part of the system plan, so they have to be approved by the certifier before the use. And the certifier is not the inspector. The certifier is the certification agency that we as inspectors work for. We check to make sure that what you have in your system plan is actually what's being used. and and why you're using it, and if it's being used according to your system plan. And a huge resource here is the Organic Materials Review Institute. The, you hear it as OMRI, and OMRI is wonderful, and their lists are available online on their website, omri.org. So um, there are materials that are allowed in organic that are not listed there. Sometimes people don't understand that. It's a pay for service. And someone might have a limestone that's perfectly okay. And they they say, well, I'm not going to pay Omri to be listed. Everyone knows limestone's okay. It's a mined powder. So you will find sometimes brands or inputs that are not listed in on the Omri list. But it really helps if you buy a material and it's got that little Omri logo on it. Um, they, it really, really does help. I'd say the most common reason people use materials that are prohibited while they're certified is not reading labels, as I kind of just shared that, um, or by accident. They buy a product that they think they have used before, but somehow that product has changed and the name is so similar. Oh, let me, um, this is what you must do when it comes to inputs. And I live in an area where it's pretty easy as an inspector because the grain farmers in Montana, very commonly the only two inputs they use besides seed are inoculants on their legumes and diatomaceous earth in their stored grain. So typically the input list on a farm in Montana might be two things long. When you get into horticultural crops and orchards and vineyards, it might be two pages long. Um, and it's always longer for livestock, it seems like. But here's what you must do. You must first use management practices to prevent pests, weeds, and diseases, including, but not limited to. So this is yet an, a third place that crop rotation is required. And soil and crop management, sanitation measures, um, maybe uh, cleaning out the weeds before they go to seed. Cultural practices could include things like um, pruning out disease um, or using um, 
good aeration in your grain bins. It's a cultural practice that prevents pests and you don't have to use inputs. But so these are what you must do. And people sometimes get into a little concern or trouble with noxious weeds, because it does say here that you must prevent pests, weeds, and diseases. But noxious weeds definitely are a challenge, and there's all kinds of things that people do. And sometimes they simply take out an, an area of the farm and treat it as, as non-organic. What you can do is for pests, there's just a lot of text here, which I won't read all of it. For pests, it'd be things like mechanical and physical methods. It could be traps or um, ladybugs things that you're doing but they're very very low on the on the toxic toxicity uh, level maybe traps for um, flying insects and for weeds you can use mulching with fully biodegradable materials they don't have to be organic you can use mowing which is very commonly used in livestock grazing also common hand weeding flame weeding very common on organic farms and this is where it mentions plastic mulches, which would also be on that list I mentioned, the list of allowed synthetics. But there is a, a restriction that they have to be removed from the field at the end of the growing or harvest season. And then for disease, management practices which suppress the spread of disease organisms or applying, um, the, I guess one thing I would mention up for pests that we see a lot is caterpillars. and Bacillus thuringiensis or BT, Dipel is one of the common brands. That's one of the things that you see on a lot of organic farms because it works so well for caterpillars. And then for disease, it might be things like copper um, or sulfur. Uh, those, And then after you have kind of exhausted these methods, you can use anything that's on the list or a natural substance, of course. There's a, I put a slide in here for treated wood because it's the hardest one to find. You wouldn't necessarily think of looking at it in pest and weed management. You might look at, um, this generally comes up in livestock. So people look through the livestock section of the standards and wonder why they can't find treated wood. It's not there. It's in the crop standard under uh, the uh, pest and weed management. And it says the producer must not use lumber treated with an arsenate or other prohibited materials for new installations or replacement purposes and contact with soil or livestock. So this does mean you're kind of grandfathered in, if I can use that word. Um, if you have treated wood in, in posts in your fences, you can transition your livestock. You don't have to take all the posts out, but you can't put in more of them uh, in a, if you're going to use that area for organic pasture. And this also applies to things like greenhouses, um, uh, livestock housing. And the key is new installations or replacement purposes. Trellises is a big thing um, if it's in contact with the soil or livestock. So a little bit more about inputs. Um, one thing that we ask a lot of questions about that con uh, contamination is if you're having a custom operator having the co-op come in to apply the lime or the rock phosphate or all of the totally allowed materials, you want to make sure that there's a record of clean out of the equipment. So that is a, a record keeping thing that you want to um, institute as a, a practice to prevent contamination, whether it's uh, shared planting equipment or shared input applying equipment or shared um, harvest equipment. And I might mention a little bit about irrigation water here, as that is a place where you um, you can get um, contamination from algicides and things like that. So communication with the irrigation district is very important. And as you can see here, we're down to, we're up to pages 20 to 23 of the organic crop production template. So they are they are over 20 pages long, but but just remember, you know most of the answers already. And you don't have to do this form every year. There's usually an update process. So you, you do your system plan, and then every year you fill out an update if there are any updates or additions. This is kind of what a materials list will look like. Um, they look all kinds of different ways. Each certifier is different, but 
typically um, it's an attachment rather than within the system plan. In this, in this particular system plan, it's right in the materials list. And you have to put the brand name and then the reason you're using it. If you're using Bacillus thuringiensis, you would put down BT and then maybe you put down uh, Dipel as the brand and restrictions, um, how you are satisfying that requirement that you use natural controls first. And then how did you know it was okay? And of course, in this case, it's it's OMRI listed, so that was easy. We'll talk a little bit about record keeping because the records, um, the record keeping requirements in the regulations are much smaller than most people realize. They think it's a lot of paperwork, that the burden is onerous. Um, and actually the rules are very simple about how good your records have to be. You do have to keep them for five years and you have to have them available for inspection. We don't want to come and discover they're at the accountants or whatever, uh, but this is how good they have to be. They have to be in sufficient detail as to be readily understood and audited and sufficient to demonstrate compliance. So if we're trying to um, see uh, when you harvested your grain and you don't have it written down, that's a problem. If we want to see when you planted it and what variety you purchased, if you don't have the seed tag, that's a problem. So you just wanna make sure you keep um, labels for any inputs that you've used, including the seed tags, and that you write down what you do. And this can be in a daily journal. I've seen some absolutely excellent daily journals that, that they don't have to be complicated. There are record keeping systems online that you can benefit from either free or um, sub subscription type software. But basically for grain, um, I'll use grain as an example because a lot of the operations that are certified are grain. The record keeping system pretty much would be they're probably you're probably in the farm program. So you probably have a set of SA, FSA maps showing your field boundaries and buffers. Then you have to plant, uh, record your plant and harvest dates and dates that any inputs are applied and and bin records if the crops are stored, because sometimes people ship straight from the field, that makes it really easy. And typically we would expect to see a bill of lading for when it's shipped, a settlement sheet for when it's paid for, and lot numbers that allow for tracking sales. And this could be pretty simple if you're selling straight from the field. It could be the year of the crop and, um, or it could be your field number, but you have to have a system that works. And if there's organic and non-organic grain, we definitely want to see them uh, a good bin record system with it cleric. If if it's you can actually have a grain bin and use it for non-organic grain, clean it out and use it for organic grain, uh, that's fine. It's just that you need to have a record of the clean out and you do need to make sure it's not fumigated or treated with a prohibited substance. So that's kind of how the record keeping systems that we're used to seeing for grain operations, the um, the records, if you're split, if you have organic and non-organic, and typically you do when you're transitioning, or uh, if you are uh, buying non-organic seed, we always have to track that because if you buy organic non-organic seed and then you have some left over, what bin did it go in and did you record that? And I must say that's a common thing that people forget to do. And oftentimes they don't put it in a bin at all. It's just simpler to keep it on a truck somewhere in a building because that way they don't have to worry about the commingling risk. There's no specific record that's required. I think that's the most important thing. You don't have to have a harvest record and a bin record both. If you have a bin record and it works as a harvest record, that's fine. Um, sometimes people just keep notes on their maps and then they catch up on their records later. If they write down every time they they plant and what the variety was and what their seeding rate was on the map, then they can always catch up later. But records should be kept in real time, I, I guess. And I'm the first one to be guilty of that. Uh, keeping your records in real time is so valuable to you and also more likely not to have mistakes. And there is a section in the system plan for this. I almost universally don't like the 
uh, system plan forms record keeping sections because they tend to be often just a list. Which of the following do you keep? And you just check a whole bunch of records. It doesn't really paint a, a very clear picture of, at all of what the inspector will see when they get there. And we end up spending a lot of our time on inspection in the records. One of the things that the inspector will do is to uh, do a trace back and make sure that your the grain that you sold, the settlement sheet, or it goes back to a bill of lading when it left the farm, goes back to a bin if it was stored or to a field if it wasn't, and that we can see the harvest record and any, any, any inputs, including seed. So we'll trace it all the way back. The other thing that we do is what's called an in and out balance to make sure that you're not selling more organic than is reasonable. So we are likely, if you have non-organic corn and organic corn, we're likely to audit those crops and make sure that typically, if you, uh, depends what your system is, but oftentimes the organic crop yields will be higher than your non-organic, not always. And we want to make sure that you've sold a reasonable amount of non-organic crop uh, so that we um, are sure that there wasn't a mixing of, of loads. So this last section will be um, just some odd things from the rest of the regulations that you should know that don't really fit um, into the crop standards. But the inspection occurs annually. It's required that every farm be inspected annually. And you have to annually update your system plan and pay fees. So typically the recertification process is much easier, but the re the inspection process may not be any shorter because when you're first getting inspected, you don't have organic crops to audit. And after you are certified, then we spend a lot of time doing those tracebacks and, and in, in out balances. We can take samples. We might take samples. 5% of the operations uh, that a certifier certifiers certifies has to be um residue sampled, and then unannounced inspections can occur as well. The inspector uh, is usually the only person from the certification agency that will be at your farm, and they will conclude their inspection with a, a what's called an exit interview. And that's when they tell you anything that might um, be a concern. For example, if you had corn last year and corn this year, and there was nothing in between, or if you didn't record your three uh, sources of, of organic seed that you contacted before you bought organic seed, those kinds of things. And we almost always, that's a written document and we review it together with you. So there shouldn't be any surprises when you get your letter from the certification agency. The um, exit interview has to be done with someone that, that knows the operation and is authorized to sign for it. It will include if there's any outstanding information that you didn't have um, and any um, and any issues of concern that we have. So there should have been surprises. Um, it's usually a very positive process, actually. Inspection is generally a, a really good opportunity to discuss discuss with someone else your operation. And I, as an inspector, love all of those discussions. So we're constantly what we're doing is verifying that the practices on the farm match the plan. So it's important that if there are uh, is a reason for you to update your plan that you notice notify your certification agency and don't wait for the inspector. For example, if you um, got another input and always contact the certifier about inputs. Things like weather, things like equipment breakdowns, um, last minute changes to seed purchases, they're just part of farming. And you just have to remember that your system plan says you're doing something. And if you're doing something different, you need to notify the certifier. This is what the USDA seal looks like. This is the only two ways that it can look, with one exception, actually. Um, these four little lines that you see that look like the field uh, rows, those are not required, but there's only two color, allowed color schemes for the seal. It's the black and white, and it matters even whether the black is USDA or whether the black is organic. So there, it's very regulated, it's trademarked, and 
and it's one of the most highly recognized organic seals in the world. We are in the U.S. the biggest market for organic crops. Um, so it's come a long ways in that 20 years since we got the form. I did want to just talk a tiny bit about um, livestock because it would take a whole nother hour to go through the livestock system plan. There will be a separate system plan for livestock and a separate, um, a separate, uh, quite a, I think almost more standards to follow, a lot more detail in the standards. So basically you have to have all organic feed for slaughter stock. If you buy any non-organic feed at all, even if it's just a little bit of supplement for the 4-H deer or whatever, it makes it uh, not organic. And ruminants must get at least 30% of their dry matter intake from pasture during the grazing season. If uh, something like a cow-calf operation or sheep, that's pretty easy because if you're not getting at least 30% dry matter from pasture, you're probably out of business. Um, the, the mothers have to be managed organically for the last third of gestation. So for a cow, that means that you could actually feed non-organic feed up until the last third of gestation if you had to. That cow could never be organic. But the, but the offspring just have to have um, the last third of gestation as organic. And no routine use of parasiticides, which means pour on like Ivomec. Uh, no antibiotics for slaughter stock ever. If they get a shot of antibiotic, they're out of the program forever. There are some medications on the list that are allowed though. And humane treatment of livestock is very much a part of the rule. You can't withhold treatment from an animal that needs it in order to keep it organic. And no hormones, and I wanted to just say non-hormones, but there is actually an allowed hormone, and that's oxytocin for a specific use, and that's for usually in dairy animals. But um, after giving birth, sometimes uh, it has to be used, um, or it is used, and that, that usage is allowed. And then vaccines are generally okay. I wanted to just give credit that this presentation was created for the uh, National Center for Appropriate Technology for part of this project funded by the USDA, the National Institute of Food and Agriculture's beginning farmer and rancher development program and use with permission. And um, our organization, IOIA, worked with Oregon Tilth to create a, a, some teaching materials funded by the NOP. And I use some of those images. So thank you.